This is lecture six for microbiology, looking at nutrition and growth. It's going to correspond to chapter six in both the dominant and para texts. A colony is just an aggregation of cells that arises from a single parent cell. They have different requirements for growth. Nutrients are going to contain carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. A source of carbon energy and electrons is essential for this. They must have a source of each of these things. Carbon is needed for the structural backbone of all of the chemicals. Nitrogen is needed to form amino acids. These are used in different forms by different organisms. Sulfur is important for those sulfur-containing amino acids. Phosphorus is important for cell membranes and nucleic acid synthesis. Trace elements are just required in very small amounts. These would include things like copper, molybdenum, and zinc. There are many other trace elements depending on the organism. Nitrogen is important because of the amino acids, but it's also important in nitrogen fixation. With nitrogen fixation, you reduce nitrogen gas that starts out as N2 to ammonia for NH3. This provides usable nitrogen to other organisms. This is particularly important in plants when you look at needing to have a source of nitrogen in the soil. It needs to be a usable source of nitrogen for the plant. Okay. So other chemicals, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen make up 95% of cells. But you'll also have phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, manganese, magnesium, copper, iron, and other trace elements. Organic growth factors are essential organic compounds that an organism is unable to synthesize, so they must get these things from the environment. There are different categories for the type of feeder that an organism is. An autotroph uses inorganic carbon sources like carbon dioxide. They're able to make their own food. Heterotrophs have to catabolize organic molecules from other organisms. A chemotroph is going to use redox reactions of organic or inorganic compounds as an energy source. Phototrophs will use light as an energy source. When you start combining these terms, such as here, photoautotroph, this is going to use light as an energy source and carbon dioxide as a carbon source. Chemoautotrophs use carbon dioxide as a carbon source and they catabolize organic molecules for energy. Photoheterotrophs, these are going to use light as energy. They'll catabolize organic compounds for their source of nutrients. Chemoheterotrophs use organic compounds for energy and carbon. Organotrophs acquire their electrons from the same organic molecules that provide the carbon and energy. Lithotrophs are going to acquire their electrons from an inorganic source. And then the saprophytes are going to be organisms that are going to consume dead matter. They are considered heterotrophs. Source of oxygen is important. Some organisms need to have a source of oxygen. Some organisms absolutely need to avoid oxygen. Obligate aerobes have oxygen as a final, ele final electron acceptor, so oxygen is absolutely essential. With obligate anaerobes, oxygen is deadly for these organisms, so they need to be in environments without oxygen. Some of the toxic forms of oxygen aerobes have means of dealing with, but the anaerobes do not. These include singlet oxygen or molecular oxygen with the electron boosted to a higher energy. These are very reactive, they're oxidizers. The carotenoids remove their excess energy. A superoxide radical has the incomplete reduction, reduction of oxygen during the electron transport chain. Aerobes produce superoxide dismutase to detoxify these. The peroxide anion can be toxic. Catalase converts the hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. Peroxidase converts hydrogen peroxide along with NADH and hydrogen to water and NAD plus or NAD plus. The hydroxyl radical, this is formed from ionizing radiation. It's also very reactive. Facultative anaerobes, these are organisms that can do fermentation or anaerobic metabolism. They are less efficient without oxygen. They can also do 
aerobic metabolism. So they will choose to do aerobic metabolism when they can because it will be more efficient. Aerotolerant anaerobes, these do not do aerobic metabolism. They tolerate oxygen because they have enzymes to handle the toxic forms of it, but it's not used in energy production. The microphiles are microaerophiles. These require oxygen levels of 2 to 10 percent. They're damaged by the 21 percent oxygen in the atmosphere. An example of one of these would be the helicobacter pylori. Organisms will have physical requirements. Temperature is one of them. It has an effect on the three-dimensional structure of the protein and lipid components. There's a minimum growth temperature, which is the lowest temperature metabolism is possible. They may survive at lower temperatures. They just won't be metabolically active. The maximum growth temperature is the highest temperature metabolism is possible. Higher temperatures may permanently denature structures. Your optimum temperature is the temperature where metabolism is the highest. Psychrophiles grow best at 15 degrees Celsius or lower, so they will grow in snow, ice, and cold water. Your psychrotrophs, these can grow at 0 degrees Celsius. They may have higher optimums. They usually cannot grow above 4 degrees Celsius. Where you're most likely to encounter these is in low temperature food spoilage. So this is why you can have food in the refrigerator and it can still spoil is these organisms. Mesophiles like 20 to 40 degrees Celsius. This is where most of your pathogens are. This is also the temperature range the human body falls in. Thermoduric organisms are mesophiles who can survive brief periods of higher temperature. This is why just briefly heating things up will not necessarily kill all of the pathogens. Thermophiles, they like to live above 45 degrees Celsius. You would find these in compost and hot springs. So these are also important in helping to break down sewage. Hyperthermophiles, these are above 80 degrees Celsius. You would find these in submarine hot springs, things like the pyrodictium. These naturally grow at 113 degrees Celsius, and they can survive up to an hour in an autoclave at 121 degrees Celsius. These are sometimes called extreme thermophiles. So most of these we do not run into and have problems with them being pathogens because 113 degrees Celsius is not going to be something we're going to be running into for temperatures in the environment we survive in. This is a link that just has some more information on these hyperthermophiles. They're kind of interesting organisms. The pH can interfere with bonding, so neutrophiles like to live at a pH of 6.5 to 7.5. This includes most tissues in the body. Acidophiles like an acidic habitat. This would be something like H. pylori, and it does live in a very acidic environment in the human stomach. Alkalinophiles, they like to live in an alkaline habitat. Vibrio cholera is going to be an organism that grows best at a pH of 9. So the amount of water can be important. Your osmotic pressure is the pressure exerted on a semi-permeable membrane. Too much or too little water will affect the cell's ability to survive. Plasmolysis is the shriveling of the cytoplasm due to water loss. So most organisms need to have an adequate water, water source. Some need to grow under high osmotic pressure. These would be things like your obligate fluorophiles. They're adapted to this high osmotic pressure, such as in the Great Salt Lake. Some of these can tolerate up to 30% salt. Staph tolerates up to 20% salt, so it can grow on skin, even sweaty skin. Sometimes they're considered the extreme halophiles. Facultative halophiles don't require the high salt, but they can tolerate up to 2%. A few can even tolerate up to 15%. Some will have pressure requirements. These are the barophiles. They live under extreme pressure. This will tend to be under water. So for every 10 meters of water depth, the pressure is going to increase one atmosphere. Some of these organisms are actually being studied for biotechnology and medical applications. They haven't been something we've had ready access to, so we still have lots of potential in terms of being able to help us.
So the ecology of microbes can be really interesting. They do live in association with other organisms. Biofilms are created when you have different species that attach as a group. They will display metabolic and structural traits that are different than those expressed by those organisms alone. One of the places where you have a biofilm is on your teeth. This is a time-lapse video of biofilm growing on teeth, and then you can see there's additional information on biofilms here in this video clip. Bacteria can be quorum sensing, where they can respond to the density of nearby bacteria. They can see how many others are around and determine whether or not they want to live in that area. This can help influence their ability to cause disease. A lot of microbes that could cause disease will choose not to when they sense that there are other bacteria living in that particular environment. So this is one of the ways why having normal bacteria in your body is so important to help prevent disease. There are some fungi and bacteria that can survive radiation levels that are actually 7, 000, several thousand times what kills humans. We're looking at these organisms as having the potential to clean up nuclear waste where humans really can't go. So here's a video on some of the extremophiles that you can watch. Now we're going to look at culturing. An inoculum is a sample of a culture, and the culture is going to need something to grow on, which is your medium. The medium is just a collection of nutrients that allows the organisms to grow. A culture is going to be microorganisms that grow from an inoculum. Broth is liquid media. The colonies are the cultures that are visible on the surface of the solid medium. You can't really see them on the surface generally of a liquid medium. Instead, you will just have the medium become more foggy. When we look at colonies, we describe their appearance by shape, margin, elevation, size, texture, appearance, pigmentation, and optical properties. This helps us to be able to identify which colonies we're talking about on a culture plate. Clinical specimens are going to be samples of human materials that are examined from the presence of microbes. Environmental specimens are going to be taken from sources in the environment. These would be things like ponds, streams, soil, or the air. What you're hoping for when working in the lab is a pure culture. This is a culture composed of cells that arise from just a single progenitor. We sometimes refer to them as colony forming units, which is just a single cell or a group of related cells that generate a colony. You want to have them come from just a single cell whenever possible so that you're working with a set of clones. They're all exactly the same. To do this, when you take and use colonies, you want isolated colonies that are separate and distinct from all the other colonies that you see on the plate. When something is sterile, it's free of microbial contaminants. When we grow the organism, they need time to incubate. This is just that period that you allow them to grow. One of the more common ways to do this is using street plates. Here, you start with a sterile inoculating loop that's going to be dipped into the inoculum, and then it's spread out over the medium to separate the organisms and isolate your colony-forming units. Here, you're mechanically spreading them out over the medium to try and get single cells to grow into colonies. Pore plates, these are going to use a different way of doing this. Your colony forming units are going to be separated using a series of dilutions that are mixed and poured into petri dishes. Other ways of culturing with large organisms, they can sometimes be picked up with micropipettes. We have several different types of culture media. Petri plates or petri dishes are going to be little glass plates that are filled with warm auger and allowed to solidify. So they are about the texture of jello. Slants or slant tubes are going to be auger that solidifies at an angle. This allows for a larger growing surface where the bottom is almost anaerobic. You can also have the tubes just be at a normal angle, and we call those deeps. When we use defined media, it's sometimes called synthetic media, the exact chemical composition is known, so we refer to those as chemically defined. Complex media is going to contain nutrients that are released by the partial digestion of things like yeast, beef, soy, or other proteins. A nutrient broth is in a liquid form, but it can easily be converted into a nutrient auger when the auger is added 
to be in the solid form. Auger is just derived from seaweed. Selective media is going to favor the growth of some organisms and inhibit the growth of others. Differential media, these can be used to have a presence of a visible change in the media or the colonies as a way to differentiate the different types of bacteria growing. So they will have a different appearance. Anaerobic media, you can use stab cultures to get to the anaerobic portion of the media. There are other ways to get things anaerobic in growing bacteria. Reducing media are going to contain compounds like sodium thioglycolate that combines with oxygen to make it anaerobic. Petri plates can also be placed in sealed containers with a reducing agent. Transport media is used specifically to carry clinical specimens. It's designed to maintain the ratios of the organisms, particularly in stool samples. McConkie auger, this can be used to identify lactose fermentation. The lactose fermenters are going to appear pink, but non-fermenters are going to be colorless or transparent. Blood auger can be used to differentiate the ability to do hemolysis of red blood cells. So depending on whether the organism completely, partially, or does not do hemolysis, it will have a different appearance. We can have animal and cell cultures. Some organisms require living cells. Rabbit and bird eggs are used most commonly. The low oxygen cultures, these can use a carbon dioxide incubator to provide an environment that mimics the gastrointestinal tract. Candle jars are a cheaper way of doing this where literally a candle is placed in the jar with the plates or you can use a gas pack to produce the carbon dioxide. Capnophiles, these are organisms that grow best with relatively high carbon dioxide and low oxygen levels. The Neisseria, particularly Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhea, is going to be an organism that does much better with this kind of environment. Enrichment cultures use selective media, and these are designed to increase a small number of a chosen microbe to an observable level. So it will provide a good growth for the culture that you're hoping to get, and usually something to try and keep other organisms from growing. One type of enrichment is cold enrichment. Here you enrich a culture with a cold tolerant species. This could be something like Vibrio cholera. These can be incubated in the refrigerator instead of at 37 degrees Celsius. When we look at preserving cultures, refrigeration is best for short periods of time. When you need to save them for longer periods of time, deep freezing them to negative 50 to negative 95 degrees Celsius. Here they can be stored for years and restored. Lyophilization is how we would freeze dry them in a vacuum. This would remove the water. They can last for decades this way, and they're revived by adding them to a liquid culture media. When you commercially purchase organisms, a lot of times lyophilization is the means that they are preserved by the company that sends them to you. When looking at growth of populations, bacteria like to do binary, binary fission. They divide to produce equal sized daughter cells. This is fairly simple. It starts with replicating the chromosome. The cell begins to elongate and push the chromosomes apart. It forms a new membrane and wall in the middle. And when that septum is complete, you have two new cells that can remain attached or separate. And then it will just repeat this process. With budding, you form a small initial outgrowth, and that will enlarge and then separate. In bacteria, a lot of times we will see logarithmic or exponential growth. It grows much faster than the arithmetic growth. With logarithmic growth, you would start out with one organism becomes 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 16 to 32, and so on. The generation time is the time for a bacterial cell to grow and divide. This varies with different bacteria. For most bacteria, this is usually between one and three hours. When we look at their phases of growth, we can create a growth curve. This plots the number of organisms in a growing population over time. Leg phase is going to be what you see initially. Here the cells are just adjusting to their new environment, and they don't reproduce immediately. This can be less than an hour to days, depending on the organism. Log phase is when you see the phase of rapid growth and reproduction. Here the population is increasing logarithmically. At this point they're more susceptible to antibiotics. 
when they're growing rapidly, they're going to take up the antibiotic, which is a poison to them. So the faster they're eating, the more susceptible they are to eating the poison. The best time for staining is also during exponential growth or the log phase. During the stationary phase, the number of cells dying is equal to the number of cells being produced. The metabolic rate of the survivors decreases. One way that you can have this occur is to use a chemostat. A chemostat is a culture device that continually adds fresh medium equal to the amount removed to maintain a culture in a particular phase. Typically, you try and maintain it in log phase and postpone the stationary phase. In the, post, in the stationary phase, what's starting to happen is basically the waste is starting to build up and they're not getting any nutrients. That will lead to death phase where nutrients are not added and waste is not removed. Here you have more cells dying than are being produced. Some cells may remain alive, especially if they can produce endospores. This is sometimes referred to as your logarithmic decline phase. If we want to count organisms, we have different methods of doing this. Typically, you don't want to just lay them all out and say, OK, I'm going to count you 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, when you are looking at hundreds of thousands of organisms. One way is the viable plate count. Here, you count the colonies, and you factor in dilution to estimate the bacteria per milliliter in the original colonies. What you do is a series of dilutions, serial dilutions, these can be done using core plates, or they can be spread over a plate. You use a cell spreader because you want to ensure the organisms get spread out evenly over the auger. Then you want a plate that's got between 25 and 250 colony-forming units. You would take a look at the dilution factor, and basically you're multiplying the number of cells times the dilution factor to determine how many cells you had per milliliter in the original colony, or in your original culture. Membrane filtration. This works when you have really dilute samples. You can have large samples poured through a membrane, and then it's transferred onto a solid medium. So the number of colonies equals your colony forming units in your large sample. So typically, this is used for something like water. You would collect at least 100 milliliters of water. It gets passed through a filter, and then that filter membrane is actually transferred to a petri dish with nutrient medium and you can count how many organisms were born in that 100 milliliters of water. A microscopic count, this is a sample that's placed in a cell counter. It's a glass slide that has a grid and you count the number of bacteria in several squares to estimate the bacteria per milliliter. With your counting chamber, you would already know what your dilution is. Using an electronic counter or culture counter, here this is going to count cells as it interrupts the electric current flowing across the narrow tube. Flow cytometry would use light transmission to count. So these two methods here, the electronic counter and flow cytometry, would be used most likely if you were working in a facility that had to count a lot of microbes. So here's a little video clip on flow cytometry. The MPM is your most probable number. This is a statistical estimate. It's based on the more bacteria in the sample you have, the more dilutions that are required to reduce that number to zero. We have indirect methods. One way is looking at the metabolic activity. You look at the rate at which the population utilizes nutrients and produce waste and estimate how many organisms you have there. You can look at the dry weight. Here the organisms are filtered, dried, and then weighed. With turbidity, as the bacteria are produced, the culture becomes more cloudy or turbid. Here you would use a spectrophotometer to measure the light transmission and compare it with a known scale to estimate the number of organisms. With genetic methods, you can isolate unique DNA sequences that represent the uncultured prokaryotic species using genetic sequences. So you would use things like PCR and DNA hybridization. One study estimated that there was 100, million, 100 billion bacteria in archaea of 10 million different species in just one gram of garden soil. So we can look at nitrogen levels with nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen gas is reduced to ammonia. This will provide your other use, provide usable nitrogen to other organisms. We can look at other chemicals as well. 